Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Did you enjoy seeing yourself on Google Earth? How many of you saw yourself? I had so much fun putting that together. I think that uh, plotting you on the Google Earth map was right up there with plotting my ancestors. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lisa Louise Cook. If you are new, this is 11 Says with Lisa. This is your 11 o'clock in the morning central time, tea break, coffee break, lemonade break, whatever it is. Uh, I will share a little bit with you about this. This is not a teacup. It's a, it's a mug, as you can see, and it's got a little story behind it. So I'll be sharing that with you today. Um, what we do in this, what ends up being about an hour together is we end up taking a break, sitting back, relaxing, meeting up with friends in the chat and talking about genealogy, what we love to do. And I know that many of you have been doing that. I'm going to go over here and take a look. Look how busy you are. Okay. Oh, you guys liked it. Nancy saw herself. She did. <laughs> awesome. And Tracy too. That was so much fun. I tried to take the little pictures of you as well to put some of them on there that I could find. We're going to be talking about Google Earth. I mean, as you can see, it's a pretty amazing tool. It's absolutely free. And um, there is so much that you can do with it in terms of genealogy and family history. So what I want to do is I want to jump right into it so that we have some time at the end to answer questions, to chat. I want to tell you a little story about my mug. And um, we're just going to have a fun-filled day. I missed you all. We had a wonderful uh, anniversary last week, helped the kids move to their new home. And um, it, was, it was a great time. But it's good to be back, too. So let me see if I can uh, get myself over here to go to our presentation to Google Earth. And, and this is not, you know, a formal presentation. This is really a chance to show you what this workhorse can do. And um, that's what we're going to focus on. So I'm going to try and show you as much as I can in the time that we have. And uh, first thing we got to check and make sure is that you have Google Earth on your computer and you might already have it. If you see the little blue globe on your screen, then you have the old version. You need the new version. So uh, the new version will be a gray globe on your on your desktop. So if you don't have it, if you're not sure, just Google it or go to this uh, address. As you can see, it's kind of long and convoluted. Be aware that Google Earth is now available on Chrome. There's actually a web browser version. This confuses some people because they get to it and they go, wow, this is not doing anything that Lisa said it would do. Well, it's it's a bit of a different animal. It has um, different features to it. I think eventually everything will kind of sync up, but right now that's not the case. What we're really talking about is software, okay? It's, it's one of the rare things that Google would have you download as software. Most of the time we are working just on the cloud. So this is going to be software that you're going to download to your computer one time. It's going to need to be connected to the internet, so you got to have a good internet connection. And um, it's yours to use. It's absolutely free. And while you're using it, it's private. So it's not like being on their website and, and having anybody else see what your activity is. It's all private on your computer. So um, Google it. You can do download Google Earth. Just make sure when you get to that page that you're looking at the software version, not the um, web browser. And of course, there's an app. There's a mobile app as well. And no, the mobile app doesn't do all the things we're going to do. However, the mobile app, you can upload you know, or load your maps that you create in the desktop version. You could bring those into the app, and then you can look at them and work with them and show them to other people. So that's kind of fun. Okay, so we make sure that you've got the current version. This is the globe. This is the globe. I don't know which way I'm pointing. Um, that you should see on your desktop so that you know that you have it. And when you open it up, you're going to see this screen. <clears throat> oh, I, I do need a drink. Hmm. Okay, so Google Earth um, has one screen essentially. So you don't have to worry about toggling through different areas of the program. This is everything um, you will see on your screen. Let's take a quick look, just to orient yourself if you haven't used it before. You know, one of the things I always ask people in my live classes is, you know, raise your hand if you've used it and lots of hands will go up. And then we say, only keep your hand up if you've done more than just check to make sure your house really exists. Have you done that? <laughs> Have you seen if your car is parked out front? 
All right. There's a lot more that you can do. And it, it all happens here in the panels. And many people will see this and they don't quite know what to do with it. We kind of get the search panel. That's pretty straightforward. But there's a lot of other tools happening in this um, panel on the side. We're going to be looking at several ways to use the panels. The, the center map is really called the 3D viewer, which nobody's going to test you on, but that's what it's called. And that's where all the action's happening. That's where the mapping is happening. Up in the upper right hand corner of the Google Earth viewer are the navigation tools. And you'll be seeing me kind of using these navigation tools today as I show you different projects. Here you can, you can tilt, you can look up, you can look down, you can look sideways, um, you can zoom in and out, lots of different things that you can do. So this is where you're gonna get your perspective. If you don't see these tools when you have Google Earth, Earth up on your screen, um, take your mouse, bring it up to the right hand corner and hover it and they will pop right up. Okay, so they'll, they'll pop right up. They're trying to give you as much viewing space of the map as possible. And that's why they kind of recede into the background when you're not using them. At the top of the screen is a toolbar. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, we're gonna be using a couple of the different features today, but as you can see, there's lots of different things here that you can do. Um, the good news is you really can't break it. You might crash it, but you're not gonna break it. If it crashes, you just restart it again, right? So go ahead and click on stuff. I, people will ask me, did you take a course? How did you figure all this out? I mean, I've been doing it for over a decade and I just hacked around and I've really been fearless about trying stuff out and clicking on stuff. And if it crashes, we restart it. So have that mentality with this because you're gonna have a lot more fun if you do and you'll probably run into some really cool features. Um, but there are techniques that you probably need to not get frustrated and to know how to kind of gear it towards genealogy. Obviously, Google Earth wasn't built for genealogy. In fact, the folks at Google once got in touch with me and were asking me about it and how my, they, they were like, we never thought anybody would ever use this for family history. How could that be? But of course, you can't. So we're trying to take tools that were built for totally different purposes and use them for our purpose. So up here in the top of the search panel, this is the very top, they're kind of divided into three kind of grayed out areas. The first one being search. You can put in the name of a place. You can just put in keywords. You can put in latitude and longitude. You can put in a street address. So go ahead and try whatever information you have, you can go ahead and put in the search box, click search, and it will tell you either we can't find anything, it'll take you right there, or it'll give you a list, just like in search results. And it'll say, well, here's what we found, is are any of these yours? And so that can be very helpful. That's actually really kind of helpful, a little quick tip. If you're not sure about a village, like I was working on a village in East Prussia, I wasn't sure how it was spelled. I wasn't sure, you know, if there were other villages by the same name. Putting it into Google Earth, it was interesting to see that it gave me the Polish name. Um, it showed me that there was another village not too far away. So, it, or it will say, did you mean this? And so it will give you a different spelling. So that's kind of a nice tool to help you um, figure out some of these villages. So let's navigate, okay? Oh, now, hold on before I do that. I want to read to you. Lynette's email because Lynette, I saw she's here today uh, in the chat. She said she's been getting a head start on Google Earth and I want to read to you her email uh, about what she's been doing because this really leads into it. it's going to give us a great um, platform for showing you the first te uh, technique. She says, I know you're on vacation. I hope you're having a great time with your grandchildren. <laughs> so whenever you get around to reading, this is great. I love spending time with you on Elevenses. Thank you. I love spending time with you guys too. I was especially thrilled to view the Google Earth for genealogy segment on episode 11. If you're new to 11s as with Lisa, go check out episode 11 when we're done. That was one of the different projects that we shared on ways to get your family interested in family history. And she says because she really was particularly interested because she has family from San Francisco. Uh, San Francisco is her hometown. She says uh, she grew up in Menlo Park. So all of my great grandparents came to San Francisco in the mid late 1850s. So I decided to jump into Google Earth and see if I could find the homes of my family. 
There definitely is a learning curve for Google Earth. There is. She's right. Um, but I am waiting through all of the help that you have on your website. And I just ordered your toolbox book. In fact, I saw in chat that she already got her book. So she's working on it. I was thrilled to see that you'll be doing Google Earth today on Elevenses. My great grandparents, George and Sarah Atkinson's home was located at 1876 15th Street, San Francisco. I entered the address into Google Earth, into the search panel, and up popped their home. Amazing. Very few changes have been made since they resided there over about 100 years ago. It's incredible. My grandfather's shop was at 1785 15th Street. They had previously lived at 11 Clementina Street. Neither of these places now exist, and that's true. You'll run into some locations where they've put in a parking lot, right? So, but we can find the location, we just may not find the house, the dwelling. She says, but now I have located all the places on the David Rumsey 1915 San Francisco map. Although I have not figured out how to add it to Google Earth, I have wonderful large photos of all of these places. You can, you can create overlays. Uh, you can also embed them into your place marks. So trying to send you a photo. So uh, I didn't get the photo, but I want to show you the first location. She says, happy grandmothering. Lynette has 38 grandchildren. I'm so jealous. Okay, let me show you her address. So remember she mentioned that she had an address. We're going to type that into the search box. Okay, 1876 15th Street in San Francisco. When you click search, if that address just is not a correct address, it'll tell you we can't find it, but she's right. It's right there. Look at that. We're zooming in. I love this. Okay, so you can literally see the rooftops and we're still in satellite view, but you can really zoom in and you can just literally click on the screen and zoom in or you can use the zoom tool. We're going to grab the street view icon. It's up in the right hand corner. Looks like a yellow peg man, we call it. And drag it. You'll see the blue lines. Drop him on the blue lines. And you are staying outside of Lynette's family's house. Pretty fun. You know, you got to drop the street view guy directly on the blue line or else he kind of falls over and dies. Or he, you know, you can't just put him on the house. You need to put him on the blue line. But we're going to exit out of street view. Now we're back up in satellite view. But we're going to go and look at the 3D buildings. If you click 3D buildings, look how that building just pops up and look at all the trees. <laughs> I mean, some people have really taken the time to do this. Now, this is not available everywhere, but pretty much all the major cities have 3D um, buildings. Street view is available worldwide but missing in lots of locations as well. But I think you'll find it more and more because they just keep adding more and more street view. So again, I can click and drag on the screen. I'm going to come down to the gallery because I want to look at that map she mentioned. In the gallery, you'll find Rumsey historical maps. We're going to click that. There's a kind of a gold medallion you'll see. Now, I don't see that medallion on the screen, so I need to zoom out, keep zooming out. We were very close to the house. Now we can see a medallion. Do you see it down there? If we click on that, it tells us here's a map from the David Rumsey collection. If I pull out even further, there's actually three in the San Francisco area. So if you hover your mouse over them, it'll tell you what the year is. And this one is the one with, uh, that's closest to the time frame that she was looking for, 1915. So if we click the medallion, click the picture of the map. Okay, click the thumbnail picture and it immediately overlays on Google Earth. Check this out. Here is their house back when they lived there. Very cool. We could even turn on those 3D buildings and they pop up right through that historic map. Isn't that amazing? So you can literally see the house standing on the old map. I was actually looking at some old city directories and I noticed that this uh, temple, this trades temple behind them, they had a lot of meetings that a lot of folks got together and different organizations met at trades temples. So you can learn so much about this uh, area. And if you've already been doing city directory research, of course, now you're getting to visualize the places that you've been seeing in city, city directories. So that is, my friends, how we find the old historical maps in Google Earth. We went into the layers panel down at the bottom. 
we clicked on gallery and let me tell you these are all kind of buried in there so don't be gentle with yourself okay it's okay if you can't remember where it is or if you have to kind of hack around and click trying to remember was it in the more category was it in the gallery category make some notes to yourself maybe keep an evernote note to keep track of the things that you like the most um, but they are there and these come from david rumsey's website there's about 150 old maps worldwide, okay, so around the world, available. Again, Street View is available worldwide, but not in every location. So what you'll find is that Street View will be um, in cities. It's getting more and more in rural areas, um, but you're not going to find it probably much in Russia, let's say. Um, so I was doing some research in Belarus. No, I'm not being able to do Street View in Belarus. But there are a lot of European countries, uh, anywhere that you're looking, just try and see if they have Street View. Um, it's an ongoing project. They're continually adding it. And um, from what I understand, Google uploads new imagery, um, not all new, but some new imagery about every 30 days. So even if, even if it wasn't there six months ago, you might want to go back and revisit some locations because you might find that Street View now exists. Thank you so much, Lynette. I love that you emailed me and shared with me your story. Um, of course, uh, she mentioned she has the book that's got all the step by step. There's probably at least six chapters on just using Google Earth in my book, The Genealogist Google Toolbox. Now, in that layers panel we were talking about, remember, that's at the bottom. There were three panels on the side. The one at the bottom is layers. All of this data is coming from the internet. And so we have to have an internet connection to make the map work, to also channel this data. So if Google was to load all of this mapping data into the software, it would never function. I mean, your poor computer would just scream for help. So it comes through the, your internet connection. Here's a little tip. When I'm doing uh, Google Earth, if I'm really busy and deep in projects, I'll put a pause on things like Dropbox, um, my Backblaze backup, just for the time being, and try to ease up the usage, the streaming of internet services so that it can all kind of go towards Google Earth. And then I just turn them back on when I'm done. Um, so you can kind of ease that a little bit. But you'll find that there's a lot of stuff in here you'll probably never use. And there are some things I want to show you that you can be using almost on a daily basis. So how could you use Google Earth? We were talking about what are some of the ways? Well, very simply, finding locations like Lynette did. You have a treasure trove of addresses, legal descriptions for land, um, city directories. You have so many documents and things already that have locations. And this gives you a way to plot them. And I really see Google Earth as kind of a twofold tool. One is it gives me the ability to kind of recreate the story right? Compile it together and bring it together in a visual story that literally kind of operates like a, a video game. I mean, that's why the kids love it. So it gives you an ability to do that. Even if you're a professional genealogist, if you do paid work, this may be an amazing tool for you to tell back the story that you found in a visual format. Wouldn't that be amazing to get that along with your written report? From an, a genealogist standpoint, it's an incredible analysis tool. Because again, we're, we're being able to look at our data in a new perspective. I, I, we think of this as data visualization. You can have stacks of documents on your desk and you can go, okay, well, I'll try to correlate this goes with this and you're trying to put it together in your database. Plot this in Google Earth in a map and give it geographic context. You're going to be seeing things in a whole new way. You're going to start making new uh, identifications and, and new outcomes in terms of what you're doing because you're going to be saying, oh, I didn't see these two places are so close. Oh, this makes more sense, right? I tell you, I've done everything from figure out, you know, where somebody probably moved to, to being able to identify old photographs, literally. So being able to visualize your data in a geographic context makes sense because genealogy is location, time frame right? These are two key components that give us the, the zeroing in on our ancestors. 
What else can you do? You can convert old addresses. So let's say you have an address and you say that doesn't exist anymore. You can use things like the old historic maps, city directories, Google Earth, and pull it together to actually find what is that address today. On my website, I have a uh, free video, Google Earth for Genealogy, and I will have a link to all of that in the show notes for this episode when I get those published. And that's a perfect example of taking an address that no longer exists and showing you how we can use those tools to identify that location and get the current address. Um, Of course, we have historical maps worldwide we can work with. These come from the David Rumsey map collection. Um, His collection is over 150,000 maps, but there's about 150 initially in Google Earth when you first open it. Family history tours. Now, I showed you this last week, remember? It was the Burkett family in California. That was my great-grandparents. And we had everything from old maps overlaid that that I created maps that I pulled out of the gallery. I had a polygon where I showed where the the burn area was during the great San Francisco earthquake. Uh, We had place marks showing all the houses. We had photographs in place marks that were marked as cameras. You could click on them and see pictures. We had videos out of YouTube. So you can just put so much content into a Google Earth map. And do what I've been calling for years, the family history tour. And it's not just like take somebody on a tour, but it's really touring the information that you currently have. And as you find things, you can add it. Think about when you publish a book, you know, it's a print book. When you find the next thing, you can't just put it in there without completely republishing the book. A Google Earth map can be built upon over time. And I think that's um, an exciting element to it that gives you more flexibility. Creating map overlays. So these are digital images of old maps and um, creating those in an overlay, which we will find that is that button is in the toolbar at the top of the screen. Being able to either have those on your computer or hosted on the cloud and then shown through the overlay um, function on Google Earth. And we can do things like plotting out neighborhoods. I did this once. I took um, the Burkett neighborhood and I plotted it over three different censuses. So every 10 years, I went back and I put uh, color-coded houses in each area and put who was the family living there now. Interesting. So see, you could do layers through time, creating maps that show an evolution of an area, of a family. You can color-code it to be able to see it. I mean, the possibilities are limitless. I wish we had all day. All right, you could. what if you had an old legal uh, land description, you can convert those into plotting them onto the map and then also determining what is the current modern day address for that location. You can even create video. So when you have a family history tour that you've worked hard to put together, but you have some relatives who maybe don't wanna use Google Earth, Google Earth now has um, two different ways that you can create video, if you will, in the program. One, you can do through their Movie Maker feature, which is built in and creates an MP4 or a WMV file, a digital file. You can also create a tour, which is interactive. It You save it as a Google Earth file, which means you could then email it to a family member. They click it. If they've got Google Earth on their computer, it opens it and it reveals the tour and it literally shows them as you recorded the tour, you went to each place and you showed them different things. Maybe you even recorded your voice explaining what was happening. They can see all of that live on their Google Earth. And at any point during the tour, they can even click and it will pause and they can go in and they can dig in further and look around and then just resume your tour. So it's truly kind of like a video game in that it's very interactive. So it's not real digital video, but it's like video. And of course, you can solve tons of location-based questions. And I think after our time today, you're going to be looking at your research in a new way. You're going to be saying, is this a question I might be able to answer with location information? Hopefully, Google Earth can help. And of course, identify where uh, old photos were taken. I did a new presentation at Roots Tech this year. 
I've had some issues with my computer, so I'm still trying to finalize the video that I'm going to put on premium membership. But it's three different cases that I solved. And Google Earth was one of the tools that I used to be able, in fact, I used it in two of the cases to help solve who were these people, where were these photos taken. It's amazing. So you can also create a histor an historical map collection. Uh, I know many of you are premium members on my website. And if you are, log in and go under premium videos to geographic. There's a lot of different topic tiles. If you click geographic, um, you'll find a video. It's a hour class and we will build your, you a, a historical map collection. So it's going to be pulling maps from all different places. It's going to be the ones that are built in. We're going to organize them in your plant places panel. You can create your own overlays um, and so much more. So that's a class. Don't miss that if you have premium membership. And even creating kind of time travel maps, which I alluded to when I was talking about the census, you know, showing through time, how does an area evolve? Layering different old maps, adding place marks to show where people are living and who they are. You could really create a very interactive time travel type experience. And in fact, there is a time travel video in the premium membership as well. Okay, so what other tools are in that toolbar and things that you can use? There are things like automated paths. So you'll find that in the toolbar, it has little dots connecting. The path is a way to show my ancestors lived in East Prussia. They went to Antwerp to the port and they got on a boat. They landed in Ellis Island. They took the train out to Gillespie, Illinois, and eventually moved to California. That path, as I plot each location, you can literally click the play button and it will take you on that journey. It will move you through the path. So that's kind of cool. Polygons, we talked about you can create any kind of shape. You can put colors on the shapes. You can put text, HD images with text. So if you find a location and you think, I really want a nice picture of this and I don't want just a screenshot on my, la on my desktop uh, keyboard, you can create an HD quality image now. That's one of the features in this new, newest version. Um, the gray globe we talked about is technically it was G Google Earth Pro and you used to have to pay like $400 for it. It is now the standard. It is now the free version for everybody and it includes these HD images. You can create and print PDFs. You can email your maps to people. Um, cemeteries, you can, I'm going to show you how you can find old cemeteries, churches that maybe your ancestors attended. Um, you can even in the layers panel, click roads and rail lines to see where are, are all these things in conjunction with the areas that you're looking at. I know it's amazing how much there is, right? So let me show you cemeteries and churches. Um, I'm going to take you to Wayne Township, Indiana, and this is one of the map overlays that I created. So there's the overlay button up there, just so you see that that's there. When you click it, there's a little box and you can upload images and things. I am going to, if I want to change my overlay, I would right click on it and do properties. That's how you reopen it. That's one of the most confusing things about Google Earth is how to reopen something that you've already done. Right click on it and, and do properties um, or yeah, pretty much that's it. You can also do it through the main menu. Okay, so here we are. Now I want to see if there's cemeteries in the area. So I'm going to go down to gallery. And this last item is called more. It's very nondescript. We're going to click place categories, go past the bars and the restaurants, go all the way down to the end of the list and click places of worship. Now when you see the arrow, that tells you there's a nested menu in there. Click to open that up and click cemeteries. Okay. Now at first you might not see anything. Don't panic. We're going to look around. If you don't zoom out a little bit or zoom in to see if they pop. Now I'm seeing them. Do you see the little, um, it's a little icon for cemeteries. It looks like a pine tree. And when you zero in on that and click it, here's the Pleasant Ridge Cemetery. So if there's information on the web, if there's a website, you'll see it. In this case, this is a very small family um, area 
cemetery. There's no information on the web, so we'll just close it. But we're going to zoom in and take a look. Now, this is a fairly rural area, but we're going to try Street View. And if we see blue lines, we will have it. We do. OK, so we're going to drop the street, street View guy on the blue line. And now you're staying outside the cemetery. Pretty cool. Remember, when you're in Street View, if you want to get out of it, click Exit Street View up in the upper right hand corner. And we're going to zoom out using that zoom tool. OK, we're doing the negative zoom out. And um, if you want to go back to north, just double click. If it, if it looks like the map is off, double click the N at the very top of the navigation. That'll put you right back up straight. OK, so here are other ones. Um, let's go closer into town. So here is Dayton National Cemetery. This one, yes, they've connected all the web result information for that site right in the box. Kind of nice. You can click that. There's a link. It'll take you to their website. You could check and see when are they open, what are their, where are their records, all that kind of stuff. It'll bring it up either in the web browser outside of Google Earth, or it will bring the web browser into Google Earth. That's con controlled in the options for Google Earth. So depending on how you like that to happen. Back here in Google Earth, I'm going to click this cemetery. Well, let's see. Let's turn on churches. Click the churches box. I still have cemeteries on. That's fine. The churches has a little different icon, so I can tell them apart. So here's, if you hover your mouse over each church icon, you can see what the name of the church is. And if you find one that's of interest, click it. Again, if there's a website, if there's images online, you're going to see those right there in the box. And we're going to um, zoom out here. There you go. So. Sometimes if you're going, well, I know they were Methodists, let's say, but I don't know where they went to church. Wouldn't it be interesting to go into Google Earth and find where they lived, maybe even find where they're buried, and then turn on the churches and see where are the closest Methodist churches in this area? Could help you solve a problem. If you want to turn all these icons off, if you've ever opened Google Earth and you've noticed, oh my gosh, what is this mess? You're going to uncheck the very top of the layers panel. That's the primary database. That turns everything off. It'll just get all out of your way and you can start fresh again. You can also turn things off by item or even the folder of items. So um, if you have ever seen all that junk, you'll know that gets in your way. You want to turn that off. I want to show you a really neat way that one of my um, readers used this idea. So they kind of combined the idea of finding cemeteries and doing family history tours. And he said he was um, researching at this Gloucester, New Gloucester Cemetery. So he literally had taken pictures of all the different tombstones with his GPS camera. And he plotted them in here with markers, pink for girls and blue for boys. And then he put a link in each place mark to take you to find a grave because he was already uploading all the pictures, all the information he was gathering to find a grave. He was like, wouldn't it be awesome to have that linked right into my Google Earth map? And I could refer to this at any time and see how families are grouped. In fact, he said when he went back to his hotel that night, he said there were two people I couldn't find. But after I plotted it that evening and looked at it, it was clear to me where I should be looking in the cemetery based on how I saw the groupings of the place marks because I knew which family they were part of. He said, I went back the next day and I walked right to the right spot. It was amazing. So see, there's an, an, a tool that a genealogist could use. And if you're already making the effort to put things on billion graves or find a grave or whatever, why not? You know, give yourself just a little more information. Who knows when you might want to be able to refer right back to this again in the future with another question. So I love that we can build these data visualizations of our research. Yep. There we go. All right. Is your head swimming yet? <laughs> it's kind of cool how many different things that you can use and things that are built in that Nobody thought about for genealogy, but for us, they're perfect. If I need to see the name of a road, if I need to see the, the, the current street address, if I want to find the churches, if I want to find the cemeteries, all of this is in Google Earth. Now, 
you can really use it to explore your ancestors' lives. And historic maps, wow, those really bring a whole new perspective. Because as you saw with the 1915 map in San Francisco, some of these old maps, they've literally drawn each building. And they've named it. And they've told you what the purpose of that location was. I mean, these maps are really just invaluable. And um, you've got things like a census record, where oftentimes, particularly for towns, if you kind of tilt your head and, and for the more recent census records, not the older ones, if you kind of tilt your head, you can actually see this, they've written the street name on that side. So again, does it cover everything? No, no two ancestors, no two families, no two locations, no two decades is alike. So can it do meets and bounds? Have I heard that in the chat? I don't even have to look. I'm guessing somebody asked. No, you cannot put any meets and bounds information in the search box and have it pull up a location. But can you be a detective? Can you pull different information from different resources and kind of detect your way around and snoop and you might be able to find where that land is. Um, so look at the documents you have, look at the information you have and see what kinds of details are within that particular collection and see how you can incorporate that into Google Earth. My goal today is just to say, here's what's possible. You know how they say you don't know what you don't know? Well, if you know that it's out there, then you can, in the back of your mind, it goes off six months from now and says, oh, Google Earth could do that. Okay, now you have another tool in your toolbox. That's my goal. So let's talk again for a moment about the historical map collection, because I just think this is um, so invaluable. And I have more to share with you um, in terms of how many maps there are. So initially, when David Rumsey was approached by Google, they asked him to pick about 150 maps that were worldwide kind of representative of important locations, important time frames in history. And um, they, they range from 1680 all the way to 1930. Um, they've been geo-referenced. What this means is when you turned on that map, it didn't just slap itself on the screen and you know it doesn't actually line up with what's going on. They've taken the time to line it up to the best as you can, considering how old maps may not be that accurate. They line up the streets and the towns and the railroads and all those things and, and get it on there so that when you click it, you're going to get it as close as possible and at least have a really good sense of the general area. So um, that's geo-referencing. And they continue to digitize these maps. Like I said, he's got 150,000 in his personal collection. I think they're up around 90,000, it's probably even higher at this point, that they have digitized and put on his website for free. So that's pretty cool. But I want to show you where you can find even more before you have to go to his website. Here we clicked a medallion. Remember, we turned it on the gallery. Look at this little link at the bottom of the box. This is in every medallion box. Get the rest of the maps. When you click that link, go over to your places panel. And you'll see down in, in the last folder, it's called Temporary Places, there's that file. It's just dropped a file, almost like a gallery file, in your Places panel. Places, that's your stuff. Nobody can see that. That's just your maps. In here, you're probably going to get at least another 300 maps. They're all um, organized by location. So it starts with continent, then country, and you can kind of zero in there. I've noticed every so often they even add new ones, so it doesn't hurt to go back and kind of relook at that every so often just to see if there are new maps available that you can download. But as you can see, France, Germany, um, Switzerland, the UK, um, Spain, uh, all around the world, okay? North America, Africa, Asia, it's amazing. Again, they can only share maps that actually exist. So there may or may not be exactly the map you're looking for, but this is a wonderful collection. I'm gonna close it up, drag it and drop it up to the top of the places panel under my places. These are all of your current maps and you can organize these. You can put these into folders. You can drag and drop things wherever you want them to be, okay? Temporary places is when you open, it'll put it in temporary. Now we're gonna do file, save my places. 
Google Earth doesn't auto save. So you want to make sure that you always do file, save, save my places and give it a moment. It takes a while because it's a pretty strong program to save that up for you. So when you're in the gallery and you're clicking Rumsey Historic Maps and the icons come on the screen, instead of just looking at the map you clicked, look at the bottom of that box for that link. Download the rest of the historic maps. The rest being another 300 to 400, uh, that number varies. I haven't sat down and counted them all, but there's a lot of maps in there. Anytime you open a Google Earth file, whether it's been sent to you, whether you've opened it in the gallery, it's going to go in your temporary places. That's always at the bottom of the places panel. The places are your stuff, your files. Then you can drag and you can move these around wherever you want to put them. So, so far in, well, just this 40 minutes you've spent with me, you've gotten about 450. We're, we're closing in on 500 old maps, 400 to 500 old maps. So you have a lot to look forward to. I think you'll be busy tonight, you think? <laughs> if you look at these maps and you're looking at your research question that you're working on, you think, this just isn't going to, you know, isn't covering exactly what I want. You can go to davidrumsey.com and there you're going to find all those maps he's been digitizing and putting on his website. He makes these available for free to not only look at and use, but download. You can download these to your computer. So you are free to use them. Uh, in your projects, and um, you can create map overlays with them. Some will be georeferenced, many will not. So you'll have to do the georeferencing yourself, which is one of the things I teach in the book. It's, it takes a little bit of patience. Once you get the hang of it, um, it, it really becomes kind of fun. It's like doing puzzles. Uh, in my Google, Google Earth video collection, I also show it to you. So it's nice. You can read about it and get the step-by-step -step in the book, but the videos will show you step-by-step -step how to do it. Take advantage of these. Go in and search in davidrumsey.com. And I have a little resource for you to help you do better searching. When you first get to his website, you see a search box at the top and, and a lot of people jump in there and then they go, this is not, I'm not finding what I need. I have an article for you uh, at my website. Uh, this article is called The Best Way to Find Old Maps for genealogy at the David Rumsey website. I'll have a link for that in the show notes. I will today copy it into the video description for this video. So it's there until I get show notes published by tomorrow. Um, or you can also just go to my homepage, genealogygems.com. And in the start learning menu, click the menu and then select maps. It should be one of the first ones. I think that article will show up on the first page. I have a lot of articles for you. That's a real good step by step, the right way to search Rumsey and be able to download the free maps for your use. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, you're probably wondering about these place marks, these little containers that we're putting our stuff in. Really quickly, this is place marks. The place marks at the top of the screen kind of looks like a push pin, like a yellow push pin. And again, when we create anything, it goes in our places panel. That's our stuff. Nobody can see it. It's kind of like organizing your hard drive, but these are just your Google Earth files. What can you put in a place mark? You can type in text. You can add photographs, Im uh, other types of images, documents. Um, you can put embed code, the code from a video. Um, most videos on YouTube, if you click share, you'll see the word embed. That's the code you need to copy and paste into a place mark to make a video, uh, to put videos into place marks, I should say. Even in Google Books, you know, you if you find an old Google book that's been digitized, you can copy the share embed code and put that in a place mark so people can literally reference a book right there in the map. I love it. Everything comes together. And you can copy and paste web links. So these are clickable. So people can click them and it will take them to websites. So lots of different content. Um, different ones take different kind of techniques to put them in there. But it's if you know how to click, copy, and paste, you essentially have all the skills you need to be able to put things into place marks. 
Oh my gosh, the time's running by. Let's show you how to add a place mark real quick. We're going to go back to Wayne Township. Now, this has my great great grandfather's farm on it, Henry Burkett. So there's his hundred acres. I want to put a place mark to show where his house was. So I'm going to click the push pin. See the box that pops up that tells me I can put whatever information I want in here. I'm going to click the house and or the push pin and put it in the middle of the farm. And then I can type what is this place? This is Henry Burkett's farm. Um, I could put the year, I could put source citation for where I got this information in the description, but I'm going to click the little image of the place mark and I want to select a house. You can customize place marks to better represent what they stand for and the kind of information that people will get if they click them. So help guide people with those. Um, so I'm going to click OK. That's going to close up the place mark. And now I have the house in the middle of his farm. So when I turn these on, I'm going to be able to see very quickly where it was. Now I'm going to turn the overlay off. I want to turn this map. So we just see the modern day map. This overlay was from 1881. You can see right here, that is the farm. Now, if you look, you can visually see where the house is. I'm going to take street view guy and see if there's street view. Yes, there's a blue line even out in the farmland. And when we drop him on the blue line, we are staying outside of Henry Burkett's farm. There it is. I love it. Okay, you can use your mouse to drag the screen around, look up, look down. You can put your mouse up in the right hand corner and use the navigation tools. You can um, click on the road and it will zoom you down the road and then you could grab the screen and turn again to see the location. Very cool. Up in the right hand corner, you're gonna see there is the street address for this location, what it is today. And down at the bottom, you'll actually see the latitude and longitude. No matter what you're looking at, you'll always see latitude and longitude showing at the bottom of the screen. And if we want to leave Street View, we can click Exit Street View. So now that I kind of know where the house is, I think I want to move my place mark, right? Get it into a little better spot. How did we do that? When we have already set something, we want to right click on it, on a PC of course, and um, there's our old map. There's our house. I'm gonna right click. I can do it here on the icon itself. Click properties. That opens up my dialog box again so I can change it. So I can click and drag it. If I try to click and drag it without that open, it will not move. Now I've got it in the right spot. Pretty cool. And of course, I'm gonna always save, do file, save, save my places so that you have this for years to come as you're doing your research. And as you can see, I could really start to add a lot more information to this whole map that I'm building about um, where he lives. I'm going to click and drag and drop that house up into my Burkett folder. If you want to make a folder, you can do it through the menu system or you can right click on anything and do add folder. So right click on my places, do add folder. And then you can start grouping because very quickly you're going to find um, you're going to want to group your your place marks and your items. I found that I like doing it by surname, but you could also do it by time frame. You could also do it by location. So think about how you're organizing things on your digital hard drive. We've talked about that here on the show. And I click and drag and drop this other item in here as well. Here's a, a final tour. If you didn't get a chance to see last week's or two weeks ago, uh, the episode 11, I want to show you a new family history. Well, it's not a new family history tour, but it's a different one. I showed you the Burkett's in San Francisco last time. Um, this is a quick little tour that I put together um, about my husband's great grandfather, Harry Cook. So I could put a place mark that actually looks like a little start button. Um, you can change them, you can customize them. You saw I customized some of your place marks in our opening video before we got started today. Here's a picture right in the place mark. So I made the camera the place mark and then have the picture. Here's where they live. That was Harry Cook. So down here at the train station when he first arrived in Tunbridge Wells, England, this is a postcard from that year 
digitized and in the placemark. I even found a train icon, which was great. And I did a quick search on YouTube. I found an old video about the history of Tunbridge Wells, and it, it actually showed um, the old train station. It had video from years ago, what it looks like today. It was really fun. So I clicked share, and I copied that embed code and got it into the placemark. And of course, I made the placemark look like a movie camera or a movie projector. So that if I share this with another family member, they're going to kind of have a sense, oh, I bet you I might get to watch something if I click that. Then uh, he moved to Five Mountfield Road. So I put a placemark with a house, and that's where his son Raymond was born. That's, um, and I'm going to look at Street View. Okay, so we're going to click it. Here's the blue lines. We drop it on the street, and you're standing outside of Five Mountfield Road. You can see that this is not only exhilarating and inspiring for yourself, for your own research, but what a wonderful way to share the story with a client, with a relative, with one of your grandkids, somebody that you want to get interested in family history. Here's a picture. Uh, Harry is standing over to the left. He's helping to um, show the new horseless carriages in England when they first came to England at the Sir David Solomon's Broomhill Estate. And then he was moving up in his career, so he moves to a new home at 13 Newton Road. And I even clipped a picture of the census, just his entry. Again, if I want to show this to a non-genealogist in my family, they don't want to see the whole census, but they would be interested to see just that entry. So I clipped that image. And then, of course, you can stand outside his house at 13 Newton Road. I, I love this. You know, I tell people when... Bill and I first, uh, I went to speak at Who Do You Think You Are Live in London, and I said, we got to go to Tunbridge Wells for a week. And when we got there, it was like coming home. We'd already been there in Google Earth, so we knew where the shops and the pubs were, we knew where the houses were, and, it, and everything that we collected, all the videos we took, we could just keep adding them to the family history tour. I hope you're excited about this. I have not lost my enthusiasm for Google Earth after all these years. I continue to find things. I can't believe, like I said, most recently, the, the photos I've been able to identify using it. It's just amazing. How do you remember it all? Well, I have resources for you. And I have to apologize to you. On the show notes I published for the last episode, I think I totally put the wrong coupon code for, for the Google Earth videos. I know it was a blonde moment. I've extended it. It's there. And I've added the book. So if you want to learn how to do it. The code is EARTH11. Think of 11 Zs and EARTH, Google EARTH. It's EARTH11 at the store at genealogygems.com. So uh, the book was just published this year in January. So it's all current and up to date and the videos will show you what you're learning in the book. Get that right this time. All right, let's jump back here. I want to see what you guys have been doing. I'm guessing that You've had some fun? Let's see. Places I know very well, Andrew says. Yes, awesome. I hope that you guys have been putting, if you have questions, and I know there's probably a lot of questions because I'm just giving you an overview of kind of what it can do for you, a couple of the how-tos. Um, things on your checklist tonight and this week will be to try out the gallery. Um, Go and download the rest of the historic maps. Get those into your places panel. Why don't you do add a folder, at least one folder in your places panel. Practice saving, because remember it doesn't save for you. And create some place marks. You know, I think it'd be really fun to, um, one of the easiest projects that you can do is just go in and map out your childhood. How about your story? Go in and tell your story. Where were you born? Where was the hospital? Where is the house? Where did you move to? What was your favorite place to go to? And uh, why not even go to YouTube and do some searches on the history of your old hometown and see if you can find some old videos if you don't have your own home movies. I'm so glad you've been enjoying it. Ah, some people are fascinated. That's very, very cool. Um, let me see here. I did something and I wanted to show you. Let me see. Bear with me because I want to see if I can do this correctly here. I have a video. Where is it? No. Okay. Keep talking to each other. 
because I, I really want to show you this video. It's, it's kind of cool. Hold on. So I'm going to copy this. I don't know if I can do this right. Duplicate. All right, let's try it. If it doesn't work, I'm going to put it on this little video on um, the show notes page for you, but we'll see if I can get it on here. There's always something, always something. Let's see. Place marks. Oh, yes. Okay, I think this is going to work. You guys are so patient, but you know what? I just think this was really fun. And I don't know if it's gonna work. Okay, hold on. <laughs> I'm moving my, I don't know if you can see it all. Okay, I wanted to show you, if you like to shop, here's a really fun place to go shopping. It's in Kentucky, it's in Louisville. And it's kind of interesting. There's a Bed Bath & Beyond here in Louisville. In fact, we you go into Street View, you can see it's lots of stores. People are starting to get out into the stores these days, starting to get out of the house. So that's kind of fun. But if you're a member of the Burks family, you might be interested in something else. You can't really shop for the Burks family, but there is something else in this shopping center in Louisville for you. We're going to exit out of Street View and look around the parking lot. There it is. This, my friends, is the Burks Family Cemetery. <laughs> and no, the cemetery, I don't think, is in Google Earth. Look at this. There is one tiny little gate. You can peek through. Otherwise, when you drive into the, into the shopping center, all you see are the hedges. So if you're not there in person, the only way to really view this cemetery is with Google Earth to get above it. Isn't that amazing? And yes, if you click it, oh, Google knows where it is. Burke's Family Cemetery. So I had to click the reviews. Why is somebody reviewing a cemetery? He says there's lots of parking, but it's kind of dead at night. <laughs> okay, I, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I couldn't help myself. You guys are, I know, I'm silly. All right, I have to tell you about my mug. This is Laura Inga's Wilder, her home and museum in Mansfield, Missouri. I had an opportunity to go out there. This is where the Little House books began. If you've ever been to Springfield, well, Springfield, it's nearby. Wonderful, wonderful place. There's actually a couple of different Laura Ingalls Wilder uh, locations around the U.S. Um, I grew up on her books. I think it's a huge reason why I love genealogy because it, it just dawned on me, holy smokes, do I have any pioneers in my family? And that really kept me going through my grade school years um, and my interest in family history. And I have to share with you her desk. This is where she wrote the first books at Rocky Ridge Farm. So pretty fun. I hope that you had some fun today, that you learned something new, that uh, you'll leave me a question in the comments if you have a question. Uh, if you want to save chat, and this is my last question for you today, do you want a chat download in the show notes? I know some of you said you don't always see the chat after the live video is over, and would you be interested? Is that something that you want? There's two things we can do. One, I, can, I always download it so I can put it as a download on the show notes page. The other thing that you can do is you can go to the web store for your web browser. Like if you're on Chrome, you go to the Chrome web store and search for save live streaming chats for YouTube. Just put in YouTube live chats. <laughs> It'll pop up. I've put that on both my computers and when you slide the little button before the show begins, it saves it for you. So let me know. I don't know. Some people have said, you know, gosh, I went back and the live chat was gone and I wanted, I didn't get a chance to read while you were talking and showing me things. So um, I hope you had fun. 
Wonderful to see you again. I can't wait to go in and read all of the chat. And we will meet here again next week. Um, uh, have a happy, happy day. Make somebody else very happy in your life today, okay? I'll talk to you soon.